Welcome, cosmic listeners, to a journey unlike any other you've embarked upon. As the vastness of space stretches out before us, so too does the vastness of our own minds. This is where the ethereal meets the extraterrestrial, where inner space meets outer space. I'm your guide, alongside my hosts, Doro and Matt, and you're tuning into the intersection of meditation and mysteries beyond our stars. Picture this, a vast universe, ever-expanding, filled with stars, galaxies, and possibilities. Now visualize our own minds equally deep, intricate, and filled with untapped potential. What if these two worlds aren't as separate as they seem? All right, thank you to our AI intro host, virtual. Hi, Doro. Hey, Matt. It's great to be back. Thanks for yeah. having me. Oh, thanks for joining me once again. I really enjoyed editing and putting out our uh, previous episode and discussion. <laughs> yeah, this has been a real, a real adventure. It's yeah. fun. So um, welcome to our audience. This is Meditation and Aliens with Doro and Matt, episode two. And we're going to do, we've decided to do a switch the format just slightly uh, and just have the guided meditation at the end. Uh, we were talking about it and it seemed energetically that felt like the best way to go. Um, so at the at the 45, well, it's 9, 12, in about like 30 minutes, we will do a 15 minute guided meditation at the end of this. And uh, then that will be the conclusion of this. But before we get there, we're going to go into the alien related, uh, the alien update first, if you're ready for that, Toro. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot going on. So, and I'm sure I haven't caught up with all of it. So yeah, oh, fill us well, in. Well, should, should, maybe we should just, uh, I'm kind of curious which things, um, do you want to, you know, just share which major things have really caught your attention or, uh, well, a couple of things, I guess, is, uh, the, um, the the information coming out of mexico right mm -hmm. that the the uh i guess it was the mexican version of their per, their congress is has admitted and actually put on display some of these uh, alien bodies that they claim to have found so that's big <laughs> yeah yeah um, and also stephen greer i mean he's he's been really uh, getting vocal in I guess he's just put out another movie and, um, you know, I'm just sh seeing a lot of him saying, you know, we've got to have heads up here because they could be getting ready for the great blue beam project. Uh, so that's a whole discussion unto itself. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on <laughs> that I'm seeing. So you, you tell me what you're seeing. Okay. Well, I want to make a note of, uh, you referenced the blue beam uh project and uh we might do you want to just like we want we can come back to that and you can explain what that the idea of that is and definitely we should talk about Stephen greer yeah. um and i okay so let's see I'll, I'll go through what i have on my list uh just to catch up anyone who wants to know where are we in this ufo dis alien disclosure moment in history um yeah was it yesterday or the day before yesterday there was a mexican ufo hearing uh, in their Congress, as you said, and the Ryan Graves attended the one of the jet pilots that testified before the U.S. Congress with uh, Commander uh, Faber and Faber and uh, David Grush. Um, but it apparently Ryan Graves is kind of um, upset and embarrassed that he was there for the alien bodies that were rolled out. Um, he's uh, he did not know that was going to happen apparently. Um, but in any case, yes, they presented these three fingered mummies that were these tiny uh, that look like little aliens. And they said, um, I'm, I'm giving sort of a really uh, general summary, but they said they did thorough testing of these uh, bodies and found great amount of evidence that they're not human and that they're some sort of non-human species of uh 
uh, presumably they're assuming an intelligent uh, alien of some sort, or at least bipedal little beings that look like they could be um, intelligent beings. And they had there's a, a ton of remarkable things about these bodies, and but there's also a mass amount of skepticism and um, floating around. So definitely uh, there's a lot to go into and talk about there, but we can come back to the Mexican mummy, um, the aliens i'll uh let me just skip to a couple other details we want to make sure everyone knows about um let's see congressman burchett said that uh speaker mccarthy has promised they'll do another hearing um, a second ufo hearing in the u.s so that but apparently no they, they requested the ability to make what is called a select committee which would be a special congressional committee that could have subpoena power um that has not been approved yet there is also the uh, NDAA UFO Disclosure Act, major piece of legislation that is uh, basically says to the intelligence community and to all private uh, corporations in the US, if you have UFOs, alien technology, you have to hand it over to the United States government uh, within a certain time period. Um, that has not passed yet, but it is. it is uh, looks like it's in process and it's got the backing of Senator Schumer um, and many other. It seems like it's it's got the backing of all the power figures in Congress. Can you say what that act is again? It was a FEEA or what? It's you the that? NDAA. I believe it's the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, okay. The the reason they roll these laws into that I, I is because I believe the whole uh, military industrial complex wants this act to pass because it has all of their oh sure you know, money in it. So they stick in stuff that Congress. This is where Congress put stuff that they want to get by um, the powers that might block it. That's how they did last year to uh, in the NDAA for last year was how they created, you know, the little UAP stuff that we have in place now um, for disclosure. So it's just a more aggressive act. <laughs> but yeah, if that passes in December, it should give uh, Congress and well, it gives the um the president, the executive branch, and just in complete authority basically over all alien technology that might be in the United States or in private corporations' hands. So it should be interesting. <laughs> it would be like um, Christmas for them. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess the last uh, thing, um, yeah, I think the Stephen Greer uh, meditation event that is seems like it's a multi-day event you mentioned there's a special event tonight i think um but yes. there's I, I believe yeah the stephen greer of uh you uh alien meditation communication sort of event is notable it's happening right now and we'll come back to that um and then i guess the other thing is to just mention that uh it has ufos and aliens have become part of the republican or part of the presidential uh, season. Uh, both Chris Christie and Vivek Ramaswamy have directly addressed the topic. One was in a Republican presidential debate, and Ramaswamy just has talked about it intelligently on his platform. All right, so that's that catches us up. What? Which of those you want, want to talk about? Oh my gosh! <laughs> well, um. I, since I've just been watching some Stephen Greer stuff, I I wouldn't mind jumping off on that one. Um, Great. You know, I I uh, I've known about Stephen Greer for many many years, probably twenty years, and uh, I just never knew much about him, and he just struck me as an odd duck, and um, and and the more I look into him, I mean, he really for me feels like a hologram or a, you know a android or something he doesn't seem that real maybe he is an alien <laughs> i don't know but uh, i for the first time got to listen to his actual history and it came from a um a, a show an interview that he did uh called classified alien encounters revealed by trauma uh what was it traumaologists or some traumatic all i don't know but if if you look that up, it's on the channel called uh, Value Trainment. Um, it was really interesting. The first probably 20 minutes of it uh, gave his whole background, which really filled in a lot for me. 
um you know he is a he is a trauma doctor he he comes from a medical background and he talks about how he ended up creating this organization called SETI s-e-t-i the study of extraterrestrial intelligence and the way he made it sound it just sounded like a natural kind of morphing from his medical background into this background because he's always been I guess he had a, a childhood experience and his fa- his uncle, I think it was, was involved in creating the lunar module that landed on the moon back in the 60s. So he always had his eyes on the sky, even though he was a medical doctor. And then he um, ended up kind of moving in that direction as he was finding out more and more and things were being revealed. So he created SETI and began to get a lot of information and people. Now, he his stories are so unbelievable that, you know, I still I still have a hard time believing all of it. But he says that after he created SETI, uh, something like um, 980 whistleblowers had actually come to him with some information. And the CIA intelligence found out about, and I guess they were just not happy with him. But those who want the disclosure apparently come to him because he's he's the one that's um, kind of opened the door to receive that information. So his stories are fantastic. They're kind of almost unbelievable. And he's uh, put out a new movie that I want to watch. I haven't seen it yet. It's called CE5, which um, CE stands for Close Encounters. So this is Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. And he breaks that down. We all remember the movie uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind with, uh, was it Richard Dreyfuss? Or Mm -hmm. anyway, Spielberg uh, did that, I believe. And so he said... The first kind of contact, contact of the first kind is where you just see something, you know, you see something in the sky and you have no doubt. Okay, so that's a first contact. Second contact is where there's actually evidence where, you know, you see see evidence where they had landed or something on the radar. So you're actually being able to record something. And then the third uh, like the movie had uh, described, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind is where you actually get to meet an alien. And the uh, Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind is where you go on board and they take you in. And the fifth kind is the what the, his movie is about, which is where you can actually reach out and interact with them um, in in i guess different ways and and you don't you don't summon them but you invite them you know because i think summoning them is is almost disrespectful so uh it's interesting i'm just just at the tip of the iceberg here with my research and digging into it but the more i'm looking into it it sounds like what's happening from from his perspective and and several others that i was listening to is you know, the question being, why is all this coming out now? Because they've been here for thousands of years. The ev- evidence goes all the way back to, you know, ancient Sumerian uh, cuneiform tablets and records in ancient Egypt. So they've always been here. Why is all this coming out now? And Greer says that he believes that it's because they're preparing to um, sort of unfold this what's called Blue Beam Project through the Pentagon. And maybe it's true, maybe it's not. I'm just saying what I'm hearing. And um, what this is, is a plot. It's kind of going to be a big red flag event where they're going to stage. Now that we have all the technology with holograms and satellites and that there, and also we have the technology, according to Greer, we actually have these uh, technologies to build s- these flying saucers or whatever they uh, uh, look like. And, and they have these anti-gravity propulsion systems and I don't know. So they we have all that technology and now they wanna 
sort of trigger this blue beam uh, incident, which is supposed to be a, a hostile alien invasion to basically scare the bejesus out of everybody on the planet under one ruling government there because we're all supposed to go screaming for help and save us, you know, handing over all our power to the government. And that's the project. So it's a big plot to get all the people of the world uh, under one ruling control. Now, hmm. it's it's interesting that Greer talks about this because on the other side, he's saying that this, especially this talk that he's going to do tonight, um, something about, you know, the, the ETs have already saved us. And I don't know what that means, so I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but, but he's saying that there are a, there's an, a, a race of beings, of consciousness being, very high consciousness, who are trying to communicate with us and and in a way that and maybe maybe communicate less than actually seeing what we're doing they're kind of categorizing us they're analyzing us we're, we're going through such a um a tricky time we're going through a transition it's almost like birthing and so they've sent some ETs come to to kind of be a doula for our process here mm -hmm. of merging into a higher uh, consciousness, but we're being blocked, and and I think that's what the show's going to be about tonight. About they're they're recognizing that we are being blocked, that we should have you know a hundred years ago had the zero point energy technology. We should have had all these uh, technologies that would basically create a, a heaven on earth, but that it's been blocked by these um, beings. I don't know if you want to call them reptilians or, or just, you know, greedy people hmm. who are trying to use all the technology for their own, you know, elite benefits. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's getting very interesting. Um, I don't know where where else we want to go with that, other than you know keep your <laughs> keep your ear to the floor because something's going to happen. Yeah, no, well that is really interesting. Oh, my, I had a question. Um, so after this blue beam, after they get the entire Earth to join under one world government, what would they want to happen after that? After they've got control of the Earth. It's one government and whoever made this happen, I'm sure they put their people in power in the government. Or what is there some step after that? You know, it's like an addiction, you know, the, the greed, the, the need for more and more power. Who knows where they, it kind of goes into kind of a, just a, a power schizophrenia or something i don't know a god complex they i mean they'll literally if we go for things like the cbdc and the and, and all of these tools that they want to roll out for absolute total control of everything we do every step we take every transaction we make i mean who knows where that kind of power can lead it can go it, it crazy they could just snap a finger and wipe us out it, it, we don't know yeah i, don't I mean know why be, they're doing it hmm? i mean they could be i mean we could wake up tomorrow under an authoritarian government that succeeded i mean it doesn't really matter if it's a one world government or if it's if you're living in an authoritarian government <laughs> it doesn't matter if if it if, if that government also controls the whole earth i guess it does because then you might feel the other countries might come and help you if the, your government does too much atrocious stuff, but, but I mean, what would they, I mean, I, I think I've heard the story that the galactic federation is real. There's a real government of intelligent, powerful alien species, but they don't talk to humans because earth is not unified under, not only is it not unified under one government, it's not at peace. So they're waiting for earth to achieve peace. Like that's, that's our, measure of growing up and so technically if someone unifies us under one world government and ends all war they will have achieved peace does that mean they get a seat at the galactic table wow that's a really 
really big question. I mean, I'm sure there are, well, I mean, let's be honest, there could be a whole other side of the story where these people who are controlling everything behind the scenes, they, they may have some wish, you know, that they're going to create heaven on earth. But how do you do that if through deceit right. and violence, I don't see it happening that they can, you know, cause everything, everyone to be under one government using force. I, I it's just never going to end. The, the violence is never going to end if we try that. I don't see it, but their, their intention might be some kind of delusional dream that that's what they're trying to do. I don't know. Big yeah. Questions. I mean, I don't, I mean, if you scare the whole, you scare everyone into agreeing to some, you know, it's just like Brexit, you know, it's like they had to work so hard to get that population to, you know, vote to approve Brexit in Britain. Um, but I mean, so they might like use a fake alien invasion to get everyone on earth to vote, to join some one world government. I don't know what then, um, to what end, the only benefit I see to that besides, I mean, you technically would achieve world peace. I guess if you, you might enjoy being in power over the entire earth and have control over the currency with a centralized digital currency. But I think the main, the only benefit I could see, the reason you'd go to that much trouble is if it gives you some sort of special status in the Galactic Federation. That I could see them being like, they want to be the ones to sit at the table with the Galactic Federation because then they get to negotiate better stuff for themselves and whatever's going on between planets in the universe maybe i guess that's what their greed would be pointed at they just want to be i, that, I guess it would be great be, yeah that that's wow i mean it could be that that you know that they believe and i mean gosh i could go down so many rabbit holes here with reptilians and everything but um it's possible that they believe that we belong to them you know that they have a right to do this and that this is all you know okay and uh to treat us like slaves and what have you and and they're probably trying to make their case possibly with the the, the galactic federation hmm. to to okay. um to rule over us and i think that could be why we are being questioned we're being closely examined right now because I think the possible, okay, anything's possible. I think the Galactic Federation is trying to decide for itself if we are worthy or viable to move into the next level of consciousness. Yeah. Um, and if we are, and I think that's what the show might be about tonight, if they find that we are uh, qualified as and with potential to grow into a higher consciousness, then they might say, well, you know, the human humanity has has a lot of potential. We're going to help them get get on track here because they're being sidelined by this this um, group of people or reptilians or whatever you want to call them. Um, and I th that's that's possibly what what he's going to talk about tonight. Well, I saw that he's also doing. I, I saw a little uh, short on YouTube that he's talking about. Uh, and I assume this is part of the thing and it wasn't an old clip. Uh, it might've been from a previous event, but he was talking about doing some really intense meditations with uh, lots of people really uh, over this um, weekend. And he was going to, it was going to be on and off over the weekend. And he apparently was going to like post updates on YouTube. And um, because I, I know CE5 involves these guided meditations. I've sat through, um, and I've followed several of the, uh, or a couple now, Stephen Greer's guided meditations. I, and I've, um, I might be up to like 15 times I've done a, one of his meditations and I, and I listen to them at super slow. I like to slow them down to like 0.5 speed. Mm -hmm. Um, and cause I've found that's like, uh, each, each step, um, at least in his guided meditations, they have a, they have a really like the steps and the progression is really like, it's a, it's a really like powerful sort of narrative um for me and i uh but i feel like each step can be digested almost it could have like 30 seconds of silence after each one and so it's like i can't slow it down too much even mm -hmm. though it makes his voice sound very different 
Uh, but I'm curious, uh, I have the same, I have this instinct from my meditation practice, um, which uh, has become way more intense since I've pretty much, my brain has started to believe that aliens are real and telepathy might be real. It's made me look at meditation with a whole new type of attention with this curiosity about telepathy and other minds or other beings possibly communicating or or even just peering directly into my mind and and I find myself trying to peer out past to see if I can see other minds and uh and you know and then in in his meditations he guides you through talking like uh, communicating I think sometimes with the aliens although not in the ones I've listened to so I'm just sort of what do you think about that and and are you aware of meditation being part of his thing tonight or this uh weekend um, oh, gosh, I don't know if it's part of his talk tonight, but, um, you know, I, I didn't realize he was going to do a big thing this weekend, so I'll have to, to pay attention to that. Uh, I like what he's doing because he's he's actually um, saying, you know, if you can quiet your mind and be in a receptive mode um, with high intention, in other words, you know, you're you're wanting the highest altruistic connections and just be in a receptive mode with a kind of an, a, a, a nice gentle invitation that um, if you can quiet your mind, you will, you will, and I won't, I can't say hear it because it's not like your ears and it's not like it's in English or Spanish or something. It comes in a kind of what feels like a condensed memory packet. And, um, it feels like a memory. It's just suddenly, oh, oh yeah, of course, I know that. I already knew that. That's what it feels like. It's not, it's not trying to make up a conversation that you're having with, you know, somebody outside yourself. Totally different experience. So when you can train your mind to be quiet and receptive, um, you might receive something. And in fact, this is a very old practice. This goes back. This is Hindu. This goes back thousands and thousands of years. Uh, it called insight meditation, where you sit quietly in that open, kind of spacious, receptive space with a uh, gentle invitation to receive any higher knowledge. And sometimes you get it. It, it just pops up. It's like a memory. Um, and so they, you know, Hindus have been aware of this for many thousands of years, and and Buddha, Buddhist too. Um, so I'm I'm thinking that's what he's opening up to. He's teaching people or, or encouraging people to direct towards these higher uh, conscious entities. Hmm. So, so if this um, Galactic Federation uh is just like you know what i think earth is ready humanity's ready they're not fully unified and at peace but enough people are are waking up and enlightened here that they're like um we want to really start working with humanity openly in some constructive way who you know it's kind of they have a problem like who do you talk to because humans don't have a single person like who would you want to represent humanity to, to go and actually talk to, to meet with the Galactic Federation? Oh, as a representative, gosh, <laughs> that's a good question. I don't know. I, I can't think of anybody. Um, you know, I, I could, I don't know. I don't know. What, have you, have you considered that? Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause I think really, I mean, that's what we're building. I mean, that's the point we all want to get to, but we have a problem if we don't have anyone that the whole world would trust. I mean, I guess we could have we could have everybody like every part of Earth in some way select their own reps. You know, we could have a hundred representatives go. You know, that might be one that might be the easiest solution is every country elect a representative. But I but I I don't trust our countries and our government systems and our representatives. So it's I don't actually feel good about that, but I was like, but if the aliens appeared, we could, we could try using our current governments, but I don't, I think actually 
it just sort of like brings to mind a, a broader problem that we don't know who we trust in society and we don't have good ways of choosing our leaders. So I feel like um, there's a there's a facilitation exercise I've never done, but I've I've imagined many times when I've thought about uh, trying to organize human society, if we just had a thousand people like in a field and they were all there to try to solve, you know, to work together to, to do something good, you ask everyone in the field to point to somebody that you trust to, uh, you know, to represent you and make decisions based upon this thing so that you can, if you had to step out of the situation, who do you trust? And so everyone points to somebody and then, every, then you have everyone who's being pointed to stays, everyone that's not leaves. And you just keep doing that. Maybe you'd, you'd actually like eventually get down to a group of people that are very well trusted. But we don't, you know, and, and maybe if you were really careful and it was like you were really choosing people that you knew and you could see, it might feel like we were really finding good leaders. But, you know, our current process of finding leaders is these horrible elections through these parties that hurt. Um, you know, I, I have a sense that we're, we're actually moving into a consciousness that doesn't require leaders um, because we are developing this ability, this telepathy, this ability, uh, this um, discernment. And, uh, and I think if we can grow into that, everybody can be their own representative. And of course, we'll have some governing structure. You know, like if, if you need to, you know, need something, you can go to the this organization or whatever. But as far as leadership and, you know, th putting all your trust into someone outside yourself, I don't I don't think we're going to need that in the future. Hmm. I think we're all getting connected and we are going to create ways of self-governing. Um, and, you know, we've got the technologies now to do this. It's kind of the way, you know, blockchain, it's decentralized. We don't need the central controlling structures most of the controlling. I want to say controlling. We need the, the central structures for organizing and allowing us to govern ourselves, but for actually dictating and controlling how we behave, we're growing out of that. In fact, I think we should have grown out of that some time ago um, had these technologies not been withheld. Um, zero point energy, that, that would free everybody out of slavery. I mean, so I think we're evolving huh. to the point where we're just not going to need this kind of military dictating, um, you know, over, overlord, we're, we're that's that's old stuff i think that's part of the piscean age that we're leaving behind and and going into aquarius huh. <laughs> which is which is much more um equal yeah well i that is so interesting i think we might still at the local i mean you always need in your local community you you need to know who are you going to you know trust with local power local decision making power yeah. you know and but so it'll be, i think it'll be based more on what you have to offer in terms of wisdom like the, that like be the, yeah like the native cultures did you know and they probably still do some native cultures they don't you know it's not about um you know power and control it's about wisdom hmm. So when you can locate someone or identify someone with the wisdom that you admire, you know, then then you go to that person and ask for some guidance. You're not setting up a controlling structure. Mm. Hmm. Many, many thoughts. Interesting. Um, but I do I do want to finish my answer to when you reflected back, who would I vote to? or select to go on my, you know, instead of myself to represent humanity. I think I'd nominate you. Oh, you could, <laughs> I was, I was kind of curious if you would nominate or if I, I kind of feel like Stephen Greer might be many people's nomination. Yeah. And, I, and a part of me kind of feels like Stephen Greer kind of wants that. <laughs> that's, oh, that's, I bet he does. You yeah. know, so that's, and in fact, I, I think he kind of already sees himself as a representative of. So it's almost I think that's one of the reasons he kind of 
sometimes bugs me because the you know I just can see that arrogance in there <laughs> and uh, but I would choose you instead of Stephen Greer to go oh boy am I ever <laughs> flattered wow <laughs> yeah I mean I think very, people very should be generous. choosing people they trust without mm. a, yeah okay yeah I think I think I think Stephen Greer, I would probably point to Stephen Greer. If I had to point to somebody, I'd say, you know, he could represent us. I'd like to tag along. I don't yeah. know if I, I mean, could be a representative, but. I would I would love to talk to the guy. I don't disbelieve him. I, I, I believe it seems every day that goes by, it seems like the extraordinary stories we've been hearing from Stephen Greer, Linda Moulton Howe, mm -hmm. um, and she had whistleblowers for years, all the way back to bill cooper uh there's it's and and bob lazar you know talked about alien ships at s4 so mm -hmm. 30 years ago all these stories seem to be possibly true it just seems like the crazy stories are, are quite possibly true or a lot of them are there's some mm -hmm. so i'm uh and I, so i don't believe stephen greer is lying and i've listened to his meditation enough that i actually have great admiration for um just his I, I just have admiration uh just as a person that struggled with meditation for the quality of the progression of of you know what he created in his guided meditation i'm really like inspired by it and uh it's uh so so i'm like i'm really curious about the guy but i'd love to talk to him more about meditation even um, and actually, I guess this is one of the things I wanted to check with you about, because there's a thing in his guided meditation where he says, um, he asks you to uh, look at your awareness. And uh, I think it's something like, um, note your awareness of everything you're feeling and seeing and things like that. And he says, note that your awareness itself is silent. And then he and so for me, that's similar to, well, he separates your whatever voice you're hearing from yourself in your head from your awareness and says, it just really interests me when he says the awareness is silent. It's a really bold sort of claim that the awareness is not actually saying anything. Um, and I don't know, it just it made me look at the idea of the observer um, differently. It made or it made me sort of like see uh, maybe understand the concept of what everyone who meditates and talks about the observer is trying to actually say they are recognizing. Yeah, this is a, you know, there's been a lot of words for that. Ramdas always called it the witness, and that, and I've used that term mostly myself. Yeah, it's that, it's that silent place behind all the words, all the feelings, all the, you know, sensory input. It's just that which is in us that's watching all of it you know we can just see all of our life unfolding and then and then from that point we can watch the mind doing its thinking processes and we can watch the vibrations on our eardrums and the sensations on our skin it's becoming the witness that's that's the way i've always um used that term because i i got that from ram das <laughs> Yes, actually, that's I think that's the word I was looking for. I, it's funny when I use the word observer, that's more of a physics term, you know, of the observer effect in quantum yeah. experiment. But I've, uh, it's an interesting thing to compare those two concepts, the concept of the witness and the concept of the observer that affects physics. Um, yeah. In any case. yeah. And they are showing in physics that it it all of reality is is happening based on the attention and the intention of any of the observers and it's a it's interesting because does that mean you know you know the old thing to, if a tree falls in the woods and no one's around to hear it you know does it make a noise <laughs> and, uh, and i have thought about that for so long and i've concluded that yes it does because there's everything in that forest is alive and aware and awake and watching mm. and um you know, Greer and, and everybody else nowadays says that everything is conscious. And I mean, even my mom told me that when I was four years old. I mean, everything is conscious and and aware. So everything we do, somebody's watching or somebody's aware. 
mm. something or somebody, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a great topic in, in terms of physics, because what you put your attention on with any um, intention or hope or wish or plan or any anything that you bring to that attention where your focus is will change it will alter it and um yeah that's what they're showing in, in physics it's fascinating well this has been uh, another wonderful discussion and i think we're a little bit past the time we said we would uh, start the guided meditation but uh only a few minutes are you yeah, i'm good yeah good to do a guided all right do you want so to do I'm a 10 or 15 minute at this point Oh, I, I think we could still do 15. If people, at, since it's at the end of the program, they can always just stop if they don't want to go 15, if, if you're comfortable with that. Sure. Sounds okay. good. Okay. Right. Should we start? Yes, please. Okay. So the focus of this meditation then is just to get into a receptive, quiet place of um, not thinking, not being imaginative there's no imagery we want to just for the time being focus on just being present and i'm going to start with a little bell and we'll start with the just paying attention to the vibration of the bell and how that um, hits your eardrum and what that does without really analyzing we're just going to watch it So anytime we first sit in meditation, we often start with a very active mind. It's kind of digesting everything we've been thinking about. So let's just start with clearing the mind by taking a couple of deep breaths. And while we're breathing in, just watch how your body expands. Notice how it feels when you reach the top of your breath, kind of this sensation of enough and then it releases just watch the body contract and do that a couple of times just to clear the mind now if the, if the mind is extremely active um, it sometimes helps to use an anchor phrase uh, which is otherwise known as perhaps a mantra or a japa. Um, and you can just say breathing in, breathing out, just to anchor your thoughts into one thought rather than letting it be scattered. So at this point, we're just going to try to see where we are. We're going to witness right here, right now, what's happening. Sounds, sounds hitting the eardrum could be, could be a, a motor running or a bird chirping or a dog snoring. So whatever's coming in through the ears, you just notice it. We're just watching. So this is how we begin to come into a receptive mode. And let's see what's going on with our skin, our muscle, feel our feet on the floor. You might feel your shoes or socks against your feet. We're trying to see what is, what is actually happening. 
through our senses. And if you wanted to check in with what your eyes are doing, because your eyes are another sense organ, you can have your eyes open gently, just looking at the colors, the shapes, the um, texture, the depth, without labeling as much as possible, just seeing the colors and shadows. shapes. So now that we are fairly grounded in the moment, we close our eyes and just rest in this sense of invitation to a higher cause, just a feeling of reaching for guidance and just a sense of receptivity. Everything around us is conscious. Just try to feel the uh, buzz of life. You feel it everywhere. You feel it in your hands. You can sense it in all your muscles. It's just this almost tingling of, of life. And this, this extends, this life extends far beyond our bodies. In essence, we are just floating on this little earth in infinite space, right here, right now. And just open with an invitation. If there's anything we need to know that would serve us better, please let us know. Being in a state of receptivity but not so much anticipation, just receptive. If we receive something, and if we don't receive something, we're still just here being receptive. Breathing in, breathing out. Now, Stephen Greer would say, if you want to actually invite them in physical form, 
there's another step where you actually project a vision of where Earth is. You kind of have to send out your address. Where Earth is in the solar system, in the galaxy, and then focusing in on your country and your state and sort of zooming down so so they can see you because they can hear you they hear the imagine they see the imagination they see the thoughts that we spin so let's give them our address Now, we don't want to be in a mindset of imploring or begging or anything like that. We want to keep the energy very high. We don't want to be in victim mode. In fact, we really want to cultivate the energy that is worthy of being a member of the of the galactic confederation we want to reach as high as we can And when your mind starts to wander off, which it usually will, just want to acknowledge it, just see it, witness it, seeing what the mind does when it's kind of left to its own. Just come back to the breathing. Breathing in, breathing out, with a gentle sense of invitation. So once we've sent out our address and given them some invitation, just keeping it an open invitation, and then we'll keep our eyes open for anything that might be changing during the days and weeks or months ahead. So with that, we're just going to come right back and to take a deep breath and prepare to come out of our meditation. Thank you so much for that. All right. We'll leave it there and let people carry this good energy with them. Excellent. Thanks, Thank Matt. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank anyone for listening. Until next time.